Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, today we're just going to do a quick little exam review. So we're in the week here of the 17th to the 23rd. Um, so you can see just exam one preparation. It's going to be a quick one. Um, next, next week will be our slated time for the actual exam because I want to give you all this, this the remainder of this week to have time to study and be ready for it. Um, the exam is going to be just administered through through Moodle. It will be on Proctor Track, so I will I will this evening go ahead and post a Proctor Track onboarding quiz up here, right underneath announcements or underneath the syllabus at the top of the course. Um, so everyone, go ahead and either today, tomorrow, in the next next day or so, go ahead and get registered in the Proctor Track, so you can get an account with them, and that way it won't be an issue when we go to take the exam next week. Um, it can take up to 48 hours to get your registration process for the Proctor Track. I'm sure everyone's pretty familiar with Proctor Track by this point. Um, so just be on the lookout for that, and I'll, I'll send the message out to remind people once once I do so. That way, everyone can get into Proctor Track. Um, so once again, that'll be up here in the general section at the top of the of the Moodle shell. Um, remember that Chapter Four homework is due this evening, I believe. Um, yeah, so it's due in about seven hours, 40 minutes from now. So chapter chapter four homework's due this evening, and I want to say chapter four quiz is also due this evening. Uh, September. Yeah, so that'll be due this evening as well, both at 11.59 p.m. So just everyone make sure they get those in as well. Um, so let's go ahead and just talk about the exam right now. So obviously the exam is going to cover chapters one through four, okay? And I will say that the absolute best best source to study for the exam is your past quizzes. Um, the exam is going to be 40 multiple choice questions. So no short answer, no true false. So everything's going to be just straight, straight, straight multiple choice. Um, it's evenly weighted from each chapter. There's only 10 questions from each chapter. So once again, exam one covers chapters one through four. The format is 40 multiple choice questions, 10 questions from each chapter. And the best source of studying for the exam is, is to study past quizzes. Past homeworks will also be another good source. That would, that would be your second best source to study from. And now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try to just give give other pointers on top of on top of what I just gave. Um, but like I said before, the, the past quizzes is by far your your best bet for studying for the exam. Um, be familiar with what a controlling interest in a company implies. So once again, what a controlling interest in a company implies. Uh, be able to tell me what a tax advantage of a business combination is. So in, in terms of like the existing owner of a company. So what, what are some of the tax advantages of a business combination that can occur to the existing owner? Um, if I give if I give some information um, about a company acquiring another company, I give like some book value and fair values of some assets. Be able to calculate what the what the gain or goodwill would be on on the acquisition. So once again, if I give some book value and fair values of some assets and liabilities, um, be able to. Be able to tell me what the gain or or, or goodwill would be beyond beyond the acquisition. Next, be able to tell me how um, acquisitions cost, um, dealing with like attorney fees and um, accounting fees and all that stuff are, are going to be accounted for within a business acquisition. So how how are we going to account for these these um, acquisition costs? Um, 
next be able to tell me um, how goodwill even comes about so how how is goodwill caused so how does how does goodwill result Okay, be able to tell me within a, a business acquisition which which is the the values that we're we're concerned with book values or fair values. So there's a there's a, a certain 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 type of the book value or fair value that we're concerned with. Which which of the two are we concerned with mostly when we're um, dealing with the date of acquisition? Okay, be able to tell me a little bit about um, the fair value hierarchy, um, the, the, whatever the highest level of measurement per gap would be. So when determining fair values, tell me a little bit, be able to tell me a little bit about the fair value hierarchy of what the highest, highest level of measurement would be in, in terms of gap. Be able to, be able to calculate um, um, goodwill impairment. So once again, be able to perform a good uh, a goodwill impairment test. Be able to tell me a little bit about the different levels of ownership within a company. So we know we have the cost, the equity, and then obviously if we have a controlling interest for consolidation, should just be able to tell me a little bit about each of those different levels of ownership in, in a company or in an investee. Next, be able to tell me where the non-controlling interest or how the non-controlling interest in a company would be presented on a balance sheet of that of the of the consolidated balance sheet. So, so where and how would with the non-controlling interest, also known as NCI, how would that be presented on the consolidated balance sheet of the parent company? Uh, be able to differentiate between an asset acquisition and a stock acquisition. Once again, be able to differentiate between an asset acquisition and a stock acquisition. Be able to distribute the excess of fair value over book values to identifiable assets. So that's one of the one of the steps within consolidation is distributing the excess. If you recall from our lectures, we, we worked through a couple of those problems of how we do the journal entries to distribute the excess of fair value over book value of assets. So be able to be able to distribute the excess of fair value over book value to assets. Be able to calculate goodwill. Sorry, you're fine. Be able to calculate goodwill 
um, based upon a less than 100% acquisition. So say if a parent, if a parent company only acquired 80% of the, of the controlling stock or the common stock, be able to calculate goodwill based upon only an 80% of, of the uh, stock acquisition. Okay, if I give you some data, some balance sheet data from two different companies, one being the parent and one being, or one being the parent company who's going to buy buy the investee company, um, be able to be able to identify what the overall like value of an asset would be, be um, based upon both sets of those statements immediately after consolidation. So, for example, if if I would ask you what the value of property, plant, and equipment would be based upon the two sets of data off their balance sheets immediately after consolidation, be able to tell me what the what that value would be for a particular asset. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So once again, if I give you some data related to the acquisition of, of a company buying another company and I give you their two balance sheets, just be able to tell me what a particular asset would be valued at on, on the consolidated balance sheet immediately after consolidation. Next, be able to tell me um, how, how a parent company or the purchasing company would treat a company that um, would treat Goodwill the, the, um, on the investing company's um, balance sheet if it's already there. So if, if a company that we're going to go purchase has Goodwill on their books, how does the acquiring company account for that goodwill during the consolidation process? So once again, be able to tell me how an acquiring company would deal with, with goodwill um, of that of an acquiree. Okay, be able to, be able to um, tell me what the end result would be on, on consolidated financial statements, um, whether, whether it be an asset acquisition or a stock acquisition. Is, is the end result going to be the same or not? So be able, to, be able to tell me if the end result of on the consolidated balance sheet or consolidated financial statements, or is that result going to be the same whether a company is purchased through an asset acquisition or through a stock acquisition? So once again, at the end of the reporting period, if, a, if an acquiring company and, uh, purchases another, another company, um, whether it be a stock acquisition or an asset acquisition, at the end of that reporting period, are those, are those statements going to be the same or different? For me, it's usually it doesn't. <laughs> that's that's the case for me all the time. I don't think that one joke from Gabriel Lacey was talking about the motion sensors. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Walk into a room. <laughs> oh, but then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Okay, next, be able to, be able to tell me how um, an acquiring company would account for income if they purchased a company in the middle of a, of a reporting period, so like mid-year. So if an acquiring company bought a company mid-year, how are they going to determine what consolidated income would be? Once again, if a company buys another company in the middle, middle of a year, how are they going to determine what, what to include in consolidated net income at the end of that reporting period? Um, 
be able to, if, if the simple equity method is being used by the parent, be able to tell me um, if I give you some data related, related to the relationship between a parent and a subsidiary, be able to tell me if the parent uses the simple equity method, how they would account for the income of a subsidiary. So once again, be able to tell me what income from the subsidiary that the parent would include using the simple equity method. I think that's a better way to word it. Okay, be able to be able to tell me if um, if a parent is using the simple equity method. Be able to tell me how if I give you data based upon net income for a period from the subsidiary and dividends from a subsidiary that they own. Be able to tell me how, how if the parents using the simple equity method how they would account for the income and the dividends. And obviously that's gonna have a direct effect on their investment account as well if they're using the simple equity method. So once again, be able to just tell me how a parent company accounts for net income and dividends of that, of a subsidiary using the simple equity method. And also the, the effect that it would have on their investment account, on the parent's investment account. Okay, same thing. If a parent has a subsidiary, be able to look at their net income and dividends and tell me how that parent would account for under the cost method. And once again, the effect it would have on the investment account of the parent. So once again, for the last two, just be able to tell me um, how a parent would recognize income and dividends underneath the cost method and that of the simple equity method. Once again, be able to be able to calculate a goodwill impairment loss. Be able to tell me the method of accounting for subsidiaries that's required for influential investments. So if a parent has an influential investment in a subsidiary, be able to tell me what method of accounting we would use. Next, be able to tell me the method of accounting for subsidiaries when investment income is limited to dividends received. Once again, be able to tell me the method of accounting for subsidiaries where investment income is going to be limited to the dividends received. Next, be able to differentiate between the equity method and the cost method. So if I, if I asked you a question to kind of just compare and contrast the two, or ask you if a statement is true or not related to the, to the equity versus um, the cost method, to be able to be able to pick out which statement is true. Okay, if a parent company has an, um, an inventory transaction with a subsidiary, be able to tell me at the end of the reporting period what, what that inventory would be carried at on the consolidated balance sheet. So 
So once again, if I give you some data about inventory transactions, intercompany transactions between a parent company and a subsidiary, be able to tell me what that ending inventory amount should be on the consolidated financial statements based upon those transactions. Okay, once again, dealing with intercompany um, transactions. If a parent company has a dealing of an intercompany transaction with a subsidiary and there happens to be inventory on hand at the end of the period, be able to tell me what, what part of intercompany profit should be eliminated based upon those transactions. So in other words, what unrealized profit should be eliminated in, during consolidation based upon those um, like party transactions. Okay, be able to tell me what the journal entry would be. Um, what, what the elimination journal, eliminating journal entry would be um, for a current year equity income of that a parent would make for subsidiary income. So once again, what would the parents, what would the parent company's eliminating entry for the current year equity income be for, for a subsidiary at the end of the year based upon a percentage of ownership um, tied to the subsidiary's income for the period? Once again, in our company transactions, if a parent company sells a piece of inventory or merchandise to, to a subsidiary and then a subsidiary turns around and sells it to an outside party, be able to tell me, based upon that overall transaction, all the way from the parent to the outside, be able to tell me um, what amount of the gain or loss should be included in the consolidated income or consolidated financial statements based upon that data. Okay, next, if I, if I just give you some data from a parent company with, with a, a couple of different subsidiaries of it, and I'll just give you some accounts listed from, from each of those subsidiaries and the parents, be able to, t be able to look at those accounts and, and be able to tell me what amount of inter intercompany transactions there are based, based, just based upon looking at those accounts. So once again, if a parent has several subsidiaries and there's there's a list of accounts based upon the relationship between those subsidiaries, so the accounts of each subsidiary, be able to be able to look at those accounts and tell me what, what the intercompany transactions are. In particular, what an intercompany payable or receivable would be between between the parent and the subsidiaries. Thank you. That was a little easier for you than it was me. Yeah, we just talking down that I'm bigger. <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> I don't know, I was walking down through there waving my hands and everything. It didn't work. Maybe it fears me. <laughs> it might. It heard your joke you just said. That's what it was. 
Okay, if I if I give you some data based upon um, some internally generated income of that of both a parent and a subsidiary, and um, intercompany profit on both beginning and ending inventory, beginning and ending inventory based upon a parent and a subsidiary, be able to tell me what consolidated net income would be based upon looking at the accounts and the information given in the above. So once again on that one, it's based on internally generated income on the parent and subsidiary, and then based upon <clears throat> intercompany profits on beginning and ending inventories. So the hint there is you have to do something with that intercompany profit on, on that inventory on, on those. Okay, if there are some transactions between a parent company and a subsidiary, and then if those transactions are not, not um, intercompany transactions are not eliminated at the end of the period, be able to tell me what the result of that would be on, on certain accounts within the financial statements. So once again, if there's intercompany transactions between a parent and a subsidiary, and those intercompany transactions are not, not eliminated at the end of the period, be able to be able to look at the accounts and, and tell tell me what what the effect on those accounts would be with omitting with omitting those those adjusting entries be able to tell me when based upon intercompany transactions when a company can actually recognize revenue based upon an intercompany transaction. So meaning is that when the parent sells to the subsidiary or when a subsidiary sells to a parent or whenever um, a parent sells to a subsidiary and then the subsidiary sells to an outside party. So what in, in any of those instances, when, when can, when can that, that parent company recognize income? Once again, just be able to tell me the effect of omitting and adjusting entry for an intercompany transaction between a parent and a uh, subsidiary. And then lastly, be able to tell me what transactions you could expect to see that would appear in consolidated financial statements. So once again, um, what type of transactions between a parent and a subsidiary would you expect would you expect to appear on consolidated financial statements? Okay, that's the end of the exam review. I hope hope I didn't chop it up too much for everybody. Um, just want to remind everyone the exam. It will be next next week um, through Proctor Track on Moodle, so we won't have class next week. Next week will be just based solely on that exam. Um, I just want to stress that I, I will put the Proctor Track onboarding quiz up here in the general section, right underneath the syllabus, right here. So everyone, please go ahead and get get registered with Proctor Tracks because it can't take up to forty eight hours. Um, remember chapter chapter four homework and chapter four quiz are due tonight at eleven fifty nine p.m. This week here was just the exam review. Next week is the exam, chapters one through four. Remember, it's 40 multiple choice questions, weighted evenly, 10 questions from each chapter. Um, 
And the exam will be in Moodle, so no class next week. We'll meet again the following week after the exam. Um, and just re remember, please, just take, take the time. It'll be really beneficial to study past quizzes, okay? So really focus in on the exam review I just gave you and then the study past quizzes and, and the homeworks. And, and everyone should be good on the exam, okay? That's all I have for everyone. Good luck on the exam. If ever, anyone needs anything, just give me a shout. I'll try to try to help you out any way I can. And everyone have a good week and good luck on your exam. And I will see everyone not next week, but the following week.